let's be very clear. Each and every one of you that has been out there and reported in Uvalde, you have all seen the extreme negligence by law enforcement, whole agencies that failed on that day. We need to have that discussion. Resolution simply allows for these families to have their day in court, and they should. They absolutely should. We have another resolution. It is SCR 11. That last one was SCR 12. SCR 11 is a resolution that we send to the United States Congress. My colleagues often talk about how Congress has gone too far, how Washington has gone too far. <coughs> I agree. They passed a law called PLACA, the Protection in Lawful Commerce in Arms Act. It gives protection, that law, that federal law, gives protection to gun manufacturers against lawsuits even when they market to children, like Daniel's Defense did. They've had Star Wars ads that they've done. Some manufacturers have put out little AR-15 juniors that they give away. They're fake guns. And Daniel's Defense never stops talking about how their gun is the model in the Call of Duty video game. They never stop talking about how this gun that was used on that day was the Call of Duty gun. It's pretty sick. And someone in Congress thought, we should protect these guys. You can sue big tobacco. You can sue big beer. But you can't sue big guns. It's kind of crazy. We need to allow that to happen. The next bill is the School Violence Victims Compensation Fund. A lot of details in that bill. I hope that we get to talk about it someday. As you all know, I filed a compensation bill that was, meant, that was meant to talk about negligence and gross negligence of authorities. This one doesn't even seek to do that. This particular compensation fund, like Virginia, who's doing something similar, seeks to simply set out a compensation fund if your child was killed in a school. It's on state property. Someone was caring for your child when, you were, when they were supposed to be safe and that child was killed. A million dollars for a deceased child, $250,000 for an injured child, and $100,000 for a child that has mental, mental injuries, if you will. A lot of details in that bill. Where does the money come from? It's not a sales tax. It's a per bullet tax of five cents. Should raise about $50 billion for every billion, $50 million for every billion bullets sold. There's billions of bullets sold in Texas every year. If you can imagine that the federal excise tax on weapons in Texas, there is no, state such, no, no such state excise tax. The federal excise tax on weapons bought in Texas is $97 million a year. I think we can have a piece of that action. I think that these families in Texas, families like ones in Santa Fe, deserve a piece of that action. I think that if your child gets killed in one of our schools, that we should compensate you. I don't want to get into the stories. We'll be, have plenty of time to hear them. Now, these families took their kids to school to an award ceremony, and their kids never came home. The last bill is, comes with a little bit more scrutiny, I'd imagine, which is ending qualified immunity for cops and for municipalities. I understand that that's difficult, and I understand that that's challenging, but we have a legal system that works. If you have, if, if you die as a result of a, a gun shooting by a cop, and it's a, just, it's a justified shoot, if you will, as the cops like to call it, the court system will grant a summary judgment, and off you go. We have a court system that works. You can sue a lawyer, you can sue a, uh, a, a doctor, you can sue, you name it. But you can't sue cops when they're negligent. It's astounding to me. And I believe 
and I support law enforcement 100 percent, but under no circumstances should they have what happened on that day this state agency, the Department of Public Safety, that failed these children for 77 minutes for a lack of leadership, under no circumstances should they be allowed to walk away and not compensate people. There's not an amount of money that's going to bring back their children. Not one bit. But there should be justice. So today is about justice, and that's what we're going to talk about. I want to let my colleagues uh, talk. Uh, and then there's a couple families that want to say a few words. I've told them that, you know, we, got, we, we only have the room for a limited amount of time, and then we'll open up for questions. Senator Reckhart, I know you had some comments. And any senator that wants to say something, please come up. Just very briefly, because I know you want to hear from these families who are really leading here. Um, and I am deeply honored to be here with you all and to take your lead on what needs to happen next. As a parent, I can't imagine what you've been through. And as a parent, I can't tell you how much I appreciate you for taking this tragedy and pressing forward to make sure that no other family has to endure this. Your leadership, you are leading the leaders. You are leading the leaders, state leadership, who failed to keep your children safe and insisting that that change. And I am honored to be here with you all. We need, as you have directed us, we need to raise the age to purchase semi-automatics. We need to allow for extreme risk protective orders. And we need to assure that there is universal background check for any gun sale or gun trade in the state of Texas. This is the least we can do. And we need to follow your leadership to make sure it gets done. In addition to the horrific tragedy that you've endured and that others have endured in mass shootings in Texas, 3,647 Texans die from gun violence every year in the state of Texas. Of those thousands of people who are murdered by guns, on average, 372 of them are children. 372. Of those thousands of people who die in gun violence in Texas each year, in 2021, 127 of them were women <clears throat> murdered by their domestic partner with a gun. And because our gun laws are so lax and do not require responsible ownership, and responsible sale, 70 to 90 percent of guns seized in criminal activity in Mexico are sourced from the United States. And of those guns sourced in the United States, more than 40 percent are sourced to Texas. Far and away, the largest supplier of guns to criminal cartels in Mexico come from Texas. So keep the pressure on. Keep leading us with your compassion. Thank you for being here, and thank you for letting me be here with you. <clears throat> Good morning. My name is Jose Menendez. Um, I'm going to try to keep it short. A lot's been said that's already been said, but more importantly, I want to thank the families. I got to talk to you all on Monday at Martin Luther King Parade. Thank you all for being there and drawing attention and keeping the pressure up. We're going to work as hard as we can to make sure that your loss is not in vain. But as uh, Senator Eckhart had mentioned, thank you for keeping the pressure on. It's important. Sometimes it feels like people just want to hope the problem goes away. Hope people stop talking about it. Can't we just forget about it? No, we should never forget. We should never forget. We should never forget about the pain, the anger, the anguish that you must feel every single time you see a video come on replaying the lack of leadership, the negligence, everything that happened. 
I stand with Senator Gutierrez and my colleagues to support the legislation he's proposed. There may be one or two bills that we still have to work out the, the details on. But at the end of the day, what he's calling for is accountability. And in this building, we like to talk a lot about accountability. We like to talk about holding people accountable. Heck, I think they spend more time talking about holding kids accountable with the STAR test than they talk about the issues that we need to talk about. If we only spend as much time caring about their safety as we do what damn score they get on a STAR test, maybe we wouldn't have this problem. I want to thank the press for keeping the attention to this issue. We have got to continue the pressure. Senator Gutierrez, thank you for what you're doing, and we look forward to working with you. But to the families, anything that you all need, it's up to us to support you, to make sure that you have whatever you need to make sure you all can be here and be everywhere you need to be to make sure your voices are heard. As a dad and as a recent grandfather, I cannot imagine the pain that you're going through. I cannot, I cannot even begin to believe, the, to feel that pain. And uh, I want to make sure that it doesn't happen in vain. Thank you for being here. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. My name is Representative Gina Hinojosa. I represent Central Austin in the Texas House. I want to thank um, Senator Gutierrez for inviting me to participate in this press conference. When he called me, he said to me, Gina, nothing else matters. If we can't do something for these families, if we can't make this right for these families, nothing else matters. And I want to thank him for grounding me, grounding us in that reality. During the interim, a few uh, Latina members and I, Latina mommies, came, went in to Uvalde to visit with you all and offer whatever we could do to help. We didn't represent them here, but as mothers, we knew that we had to be there and we had to offer support and we had to do something. And I remember Kim saying to me, you tell us what you can do for us. We didn't ask to be here. All we know is that our kids will not have died in vain. We should have called a special session to take action to make this right to protect our kids. We did not, but we're here now. And this is our time to act. This is our time to do right. I've made a commitment to Senator Gutierrez, to these families, to do everything that we can in the House. We will find sponsors for these bills. We will follow y'all's lead to do what it takes to do right by our kids, to do right by our families, and to keep them safe. Thank you. Thank you. I know we're going to hear from a couple of families. Felicia, I think you had something to say. And is it Velma or Marisa is going to? Okay. Okay. Why don't you guys come up and let's get Felicia. <clears throat> I'm Felicia Martinez, the mother of Xavier Lopez who was brutally murdered, massacred, I should say, because he was just not, it was not just shot just by one shot. It was by an ugly weapon that was shot by 100 rounds. On May 24th, which marks eight months ago today, the age limit should be raised to 21, I feel, because Having families torn apart is unlivable. Spitting holidays was very empty this past few months. Holidays are supposed to be filled with love and joy and happiness. Instead, it was filled with emptiness. This was our first Christmas that my husband and I did not sit with our children to open gifts. Instead, we were locked in our room, crying, full of hurt and anger, because the one person that was the loudest during Christmas 
was no longer here. Our Xavier was the wild one that made sure everybody had a good holiday. <clears throat> this Christmas, Thanksgiving, New Year's, instead of spend, spending time at home around the table, playing the games that we all play, laughing, making fun of each other. Instead, we were all around a gravesite, telling Xavier how much we miss him and how much we wish he was here with us. I believe <coughs> Blanca should <coughs> be removed from Congress If such a powerful gun can be sold to be used to harm or kill someone, they should also be held accountable <clears throat> just to make a buck, as all these gun people want. But they don't want to be held accountable if somebody's life was taken, especially of a child. I think the age limit should be raised to 21 because an 18-year-old should not be allowed to purchase of an ugly weapon. Qualified immunity. Why should cops be allowed to get away with things? Get away with murder? There's been so many where they've attacked people and they've gone away with it. They just got fired or leave but they're not be held accountable for injuring, hurting of another human. Why are we, why are lawyers allowed to be sued, teachers, doctors, but not cops? I believe cops should be sued because on the 24th, they do not do their job. They did not go in because the immunity, they felt that their lives were in danger, so they didn't have to go in there if they didn't feel like they wanted to, which I think is stupid. Because of that, my son's not here. These other babies aren't here. And two beautiful women are not here for their children, to watch their children grow to see what beautiful grandbabies they would have had. These laws need to be changed, and they need to be changed today, not tomorrow. Sorry. Good afternoon. My name is Marisa Lozano. I'm the younger sister of Miss Irma Garcia a teacher who was brutally murdered on May 24th, 2022 in her classroom at Robb Elementary. I stand before you, I stand before you all a shattered sister, mother, and aunt. I'm here to speak about the importance of change, for change to the current gun laws, which are lax and extremely irresponsible. But first, I'd like to introduce you to my sister. Irma was a natural born caregiver. Irma was bright, beautiful, funny, and dependable. She was the rock of our family, our saving grace. Irma was a mother of four, a wife of nearly 25 years, and an educator for 23 years. She was so loved that just two days after her murder, her husband Joe, dealing with an unbearable amount of grief, joined her in death. His poor heart could not take losing her in the manner in which he did. The look on his face when the funeral director told us that Irma would have to have a closed casket haunts me to this day. My brother-in-law may not have died on campus on May 24th, but he too is a casualty of this highly preventable massacre. May 24th was a regular day for me. It was my lunch hour when my son called me and said there was an active shooter at Rob. I immediately called Joe, who by that time had already been informed and was on his way back to Uvalde. 
I was told that they were sending the teachers and students to the Civic Center, so I rushed, rushed over there. I figured I would get eyes on her and let the family know that she was safe. Upon arriving, I was directed to stand by a tree and wait for her classroom to be bussed over. For hours, I waited and waited and waited, and they never arrived. While waiting, I was shown a short video of the gunman entering the building. My heart sank. I was told 12 students were dead, one teacher had been shot, and another teacher was dead, not realizing at the time that that dead teacher was my sister. She was unaccounted for for hours. We had family in San Antonio searching every hospital for her. In situations like that, you hold out for hope. Logic is telling you the reason no one can find her is because she's laying dead on the classroom floor, but your heart won't allow you to believe that. What used to be a sea of parents desperately waiting for their children outside the Civic Center was now just a small room of just a few emotionally broken parents and relatives. Authorities gathered us all and said that there would be no more buses arriving and that no one else would be rescued from that building. No one else was coming out of those rooms alive. The wailing from these parents, the cries that they all let out, having to give descriptions of what my sister wore that day, and witnessing parents swab for their DNA in order to identify their babies is beyond comprehension. The days following this massacre, we learned of the horror that took place in rooms 111 and 112. We learned that a child who had just turned 18 years old a few days prior was able to legally purchase an arsenal of weapons of war with ease and commit one of the worst mass shootings in America. He was able to casually walk across campus with his newly purchased AR-15, effortlessly enter the building where my sister dedicated 23 years of her life, and viciously murder and gun down two classrooms full of defenseless 9 and 10 year olds and their teachers. In her last moment, moments on this earth, her first and final instinct was to protect her students as best she could. She faced homegrown evil, and within seconds, he shot Irma 11 times from her head to her legs. She never stood a chance. She was underappreciated, grossly underpaid, and severely underprotected at that school. Irresponsible parenting, irresponsible school district, irresponsible gun owners, irresponsible gun laws, and 376 cowardly law enforcement officers make a perilous combination. Make no mistake, the laws that this state currently have in place enable this child to commit this horrific act. Criminals are given due process, while the survivors can suffer long traumatic years waiting for justice. I ask you, where was Irma's due process? Through our tax dollars, we pay the salary for law enforcement to protect and serve. Yet laws such as qualified immunity prevent them from acting, from actually having to ser serve and protect. Irma's death has had a ripple effect on our family. Viewing my beautiful sister in her casket was heartbreaking. The face that was always laughing and smiling was now something I didn't recognize. The reconstruction done on her face was a valiant effort, but that wasn't my sister's face. We couldn't even touch her hair for fear that the prosthetics would fall apart. Though they covered her hands with a piece of fabric, I can still see the bullet wounds in the back of her hands. Her bullet riddled body laying in front of me in her casket and my brother-in-law just a few feet away in his casket is a vision that is seared on my mind. The what ifs are what run through my mind every day. I look at my sister's orphaned children and wonder, what if he had shot her with the type of gun he had shot his grandmother with? The grandmother who survived his attack on her? Or better yet, what if he was never able to purchase these types of weapons at all? They say raising the age limit would not prevent these atrocities from happening because criminals don't follow the law. Well, this shooter did. I wonder, I wonder if it had been 21 abortions that were being performed in those classrooms if our elected officials would step in and do the right thing. So here we are again, eight months to the day that our lives were completely destroyed, asking, pleading for this legislation to make change, such as universal background checks and raising the age limit to purchase military-style weapons. 
weapons that are not, were not created nor intended as recreational use. Irma, Eva, the 19 precious babies who lost their young lives and their survivors will have to live the rest of their lives with constant reminders of the horrors that they experienced that day deserve this administration and all elected officials to make that change in their honor. Inaction by our elected officials on this issue is detrimental to our future in this state. This legislation has an opportunity to set a precedence in this country that we as Americans will not be dominated and defined by gun culture, a gun culture that benefits a select few. Thank you. I'm sorry if I stumbled through my words, as most of my speech that I prepared this week was very similar to my sister's. <clears throat> but I need to make sure that all of you understand the gravity of the situation we are in. I read an article yesterday in the Texas Tribune about the six main things that all the legislators have in mind. A lot of them know there's a large surplus of money. And their main priority is supporting their pet projects. The word gun was used one time in that article. One time. And that broke me yesterday, as I helped my sister Mari with her speech. So bear with me. And I ask God to help me through this. I'm from San Antonio. My name is Valmelisa Duran. I'm formerly from Uvalde. And I used to teach at Robb Elementary School with my sister Irma. Coming here from San Antonio was very difficult, dangerous. And any other day, I would not be in the road. We could barely see the road with a heavy pouring rain couldn't find parking at the Capitol. And then we come into this room, this claustrophobic room, that you have us and the families. I can barely breathe in here. But I thank you for the opportunity to hearing us out. Thank you. I don't know what we do without you. Thank you. Okay. So good afternoon. My name is Velma Lisa Duran. I'm the older sister of Irma Linda Garcia, one of the teachers brutally shot and obliterated by an AR-15 as she enjoyed one of the last days of school with her precious students and colleagues. I come here pleading to you to take clear notice of these common sense gun laws we Americans and our children our future need an order to live in a carefree, peaceful life in the United States of America and stop living in the United States of the NRA. I'm asking that you make a resolution to dissolve qualified immunity so that government agencies can be held accountable. I just became aware of this lack of protection law-abiding citizens have under these horrific circumstances. Please don't look away and do something. You need to ban all assault weapons. Aren't human lives more valuable than the money you pocket to support the NRA? And I ask those who support it, what do you need them for? What are they good for? For sport? Don't tell me for protection. We have guns. I'm not against guns. I'm against these 3D printers that modify guns that make it more challenging for our police officers to protect us. In their cop cars, it says protect and serve, but they don't have to protect us. And that's what happened to my sister against one, one evil child with an AR-15 and 376 cowardly officers 
were probably waiting and thinking, they're probably dead. There is no one to talk about them. There will be evidence that this crazy young man, full of evil and hate, probably finished the job. But with God's grace, there are survivors. With God's grace, there's going to be lawmakers who are going to listen to us. It is amazing to me that every day we turn on the TV, there's a shooting, mass shooting, and we have normalized it. Y'all have made us, forced us to normalize it. It is sickening. It is disgusting. This is not the life I want for my children, for my students, for my future grandchildren. The government leaders in our country have a moral responsibility to break this lethal habit of normalizing human death by gun violence. Stop the bloodshed, trauma, and mental health crisis that continues to ferociously grow. It's imperative to ban all assault weapons, to protect all constituents, and to better provide our law enforcement agencies the opportunity to actually protect and serve us, the taxpayers who pay their salaries. When will it be enough bloodshed? Are you waiting for it to happen to you or your family before you stop to think about your gross negligence? I urge you to take the time to visualize our loved ones pieced back together in a coffin, knowing that their last breath on earth was the most frightening event in their lives. The hopelessness and bravery that these children had to endure, similar to that of a soldier at war, but without any protective gear or high caliber weapon. How do you sit in your high powered offices and not want to do anything to put an end to this violence? Our lives are but a whisper in this world, but one day you will see the face of God and explain all the blood in your hands because you refuse to care for God's people. All of you are God's children. Americans are killing Americans and our government leaders are the enablers. So I ask you again to please ban assault weapons and make a resolution to dissolve qualified immunity so that the 376 cowardly law enforcers and every government entity be held accountable for their actions or lack of actions. And we can finally have some peace of mind that our loved ones didn't die in vain. And my hope is that justice will be awarded to all Americans who have had to suffer in your hands. It is imperative for nature, our nation to pass a ban on 3D printers that are used to modify guns. Common sense laws is what we need. Universal background checks, red flag laws, safe storage laws, and the need for mental health services in which Texas is at the bottom. But most of all, none of this would be happening if you would just pass a federal ban on all assault weapons. <laughs> So I call out President Biden. Use your power. Ban these assault weapons. And my God bless every single one of you. And I pray that this never touches your family because it is a never ending nightmare. And our pain will never end until we take our last breath on earth. And then we will rejoice with our family in eternal heaven. Thank you. So we'll open it up for questions. If you just give me one moment, because I want to just let you know, these parents are everyday working class parents. They don't want to be here. I don't want them to be here. I didn't want to be here. Um, I wish this had never have happened. I wish this had never, ever have happened. But through the power of Facebook, 
you know, become all their, their friends, and they've let me be their friend. I've seen wonderful stories. You see Jackie rolling around on the ground with a little German Shepherd puppy, Labrador puppy. Just, she's just laughing and giggling. You see uh, Lexi, a little girl wanting to be a lawyer, throwing softball batting practice with her dad. Mom's in the back of the cage, you know, encouraging her daughter. Normal families. See a little shy little girl, Tess Marie Mata. She's a wonderful, bright little girl. She just had a dream to keep on going and enjoy for the rest of her life. Xavier Lopez and Uzziah Garcia, these are normal kids. They just wanted to go and enjoy the summer. They only look forward to school letting out and enjoying the summer. People watching back home need to start making calls, get on the phone, talk to your state representative, and talk to your state senator, and tell them to do something. I'd hate for these folks or the folks from Santa Fe to have to be yet another part of this horrible nightmare. Let's let this be the end of it. Let's do something right. So I'll open it up for any questions for any one of us. So go ahead. Anything? Yeah. So um, you started in the press conference talking about how this week you have comments of Uvalde and then next week we're going to have the comments from Santa Fe. Are we expecting to have They'll be here every, every week here? Are you meeting They'll be here together, and I'll tell you why we're doing this this way. Uh, there's at least 20 pieces of real legislation we can do. Uh, this is not about creating omnibus legislation. Omnibus legislation gets to be problematic, gets to be split up, and gets to be easier to kill. Uh, we're not going to do that. Uh, a lot of, on, in addition to, to it, some of the things may not be as germane. If we're talking about mental health, next week I'm going to talk to my colleagues. And if one of them wants to carry a mental health appropriations bill, let them, they, they should do that. And colleagues on both sides. I don't need my name on any of this stuff. I need it done. I need it done. Uh, school hardening. We spent four hundred. We spent four billion dollars in a special session on Operation Lone Star. In 2019, we spent 110 million dollars on school hardening after Santa Fe. 110 million dollars for 8,300 campuses. Come on. Let's spend two billion dollars on school hardening. Let's spend two billion dollars on mental health and rural mental health. Let's spend real money to the real challenges that are facing this day. You want to say it's not about guns? That's fine. Then do the right thing in those other areas. And by the way, do something on guns. We're going to talk to you in the weeks that follow about a bulk ammo registry. We're developing those bills. It's a lot of legislation. It shouldn't be the role of this legislature to regulate cops on procedure. But we have a law enforcement agency that refused to, that had 2,000 extra troops that this governor sent down there, and they refused to interagency train with local law enforcement. They, when this community and six counties around it asked for $5 million to fix the radios, by the way, these communities are on the border, by the way, DPS uses those radios, no money was sent in 2015. They asked for $9 million in 2018 with the gov to the governor's office. They sent a million dollar band aid. The radios do not work. If you're going to do this stuff, if you want to pretend to be the Border Patrol cop, then put the right resources down there, man. And make sure that those same cops are protecting our kids in those communities as well and not cowering away. And I'm not going to say that they were cowards. I'm going to say that there was a tremendous lack of leadership. Nobody took responsibility. Oh, it was that cop. It was that cop. We're led to believe by DPS that this was the work of a the local cafeteria school cop. Then we were told it was a Uvalde cop that could have killed him. That wasn't even true. They knew it was a lie. Over and over and over, we have been faced with a rampant amount of lies and misunderstandings about what happened that day. And the fact is that there is no transparency. We're going to have a day of legislation about transparency and what you as the media should demand. So there's a lot to talk about. That's why we're not here all in one day. And I apologize. And it, it'll be different families. Last thing I want is for people to spend themselves in time and energy and effort. I saw it happen to them in Washington. But they're also here. This is another announcement. They're not here just to stand up behind me. 
or talk for a little bit, they're here to knock on doors, and they will be knocking on doors to legislators, to swing members that are willing to listen. Anything else? It's my hope, and I'll tell you this. None of the bills that we're proposing, very few of them are, bi are, are, are partisan. These are bipartisan pieces of legislation. Even raising an age limit to 21 right now has 76% support amongst Republicans. Extreme risk protective orders, universal background checks. These are gun owners. I'm a gun owner. When each and every one of you, I, I don't know if you'll ever see it, this young man buy these guns on day one and day two and day three in the same shop, you will be scared beyond belief. Rural soccer, urban soccer moms are going to be scared beyond belief that this 18-year-old kid or any other 18-year-old confused kid like him can access weaponry like he did. And if this governor doesn't want to talk about that, that's on him. I want to be able to have a discussion with him. I want to be able, and I don't care if he says, you know what, I don't like Roland Gutierrez. I want Brian Hughes to carry this legislation. So be it. I'm fine with it. We need to do something. Governor Abbott, if you're listening, do something. Do something, because you can. Yes, ma'am. I just want to answer on the Lieutenant Governor's side. He's, his office says they're willing to meet with him. We haven't gotten a date yet, and that should be happening. I don't, I'm not here to cover for him. I'm just saying that that is something that he wants to do. As far as the governor, I know many of them have something. I, mean, I don't know if you I want to talk about The last time that we met with him was when he made that last trip to Uvalde, a little bit before the holidays but it was with, for Governor Abbott. Other than that, we, they have not reached out to us. They have not communicated with us at all. But I plan on reaching out to him today. Did you get, oh, I, I was just going to say, I, I know Speaker Phelan mentioned meeting with you all before the start of the legislative session and talked about some differences on where he sees the legislation going. Were there any areas where you thought there would be willingness uh, for the Republicans to move in the middle on some of these items you want to see get passed? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He, he did say at first that he would not help us, and I'm not sure if he changed his mind or not, but he he said he wouldn't do it. He wouldn't raise the age, he raise the age to 18 to 21. That was one thing. He did support that. need some action to take place um, people are dying every day um, this shouldn't be happening uh, we need to take action today um, and if it takes us coming every week then we're going to do it until we start seeing something change our kids are no longer here our teachers are no longer here but now we're fighting for the future of the kids that are in the schools the teachers I'm a kindergarten teacher we're going to fight until we get things done. And that's when I spoke, I didn't speak about us Texans. I'm speaking national, federal. We need federal laws. And that's why President Biden is going to be our hope. That's my hope. These things are happening so often, and there has been very little change. You know, it's real easy for everybody to be gathered in this room with all of us. But when you guys leave this room, you get to leave this behind. You get to go about a, go on about your day. You get to go home to your families, to your dogs, to your kids, to the soccer game. These families don't. My family is forever changed. My daughter plays on the soccer field as a senior on the varsity soccer team, directly across from the door, the shooter entered that took the lives 
of my friend's kids. She has to walk past that hallway every day to go to the locker room. She doesn't get to leave it behind. These families don't get to leave it behind. This is our lives forever, like she said, until we take our last breath. And each and every time that there is no action taken, each and every time we see another mass shooting, we see ourselves in every capacity of where we were that day. We had just hit four years since Santa Fe occurred. And just six days later, we had to look at these families who we have now welcomed, unfortunately, into the community of survivors. We saw ourselves. I saw my friends. I heard the same cries for justice, the same cries for information from these families that my friend Rosie had to make and Chris's dad had to make, begging for any kind of information. The <clears throat> same cries and tears and hugs that my friend Rhonda had to give and that she got. I saw the same families standing with their children mourning these classmates as I had to do with my daughter for my neighbor whose niece was gone, my oldest daughter who lost a classmate that rode the bus with her. Action has to be taken. We cannot continue this cycle of just talking because this room is not going to have room for anybody else but surviving families if we do not take a stand, if we do not make change. Any other questions? Yes, sir. No, I was just going yeah. to say, can we get some Spanish before you leave? Yeah, I'll be brief. <coughs> um, muchas gracias todos por, por atender hoy. Uh, la idea de hoy es de hablar de ciertos Uh, temas que vamos a, a tener para tratar de proteger a nuestros niños en el futuro y también para ayudarle a estas familias. Uh, esta es la primera semana que vamos a ver una plática de diferentes uh, propuestas para la, de, para la legislación. Esta semana está basada en sistemas de justicia, la próxima va a ser uh, lo que es, son... Uh, apropiaciones que se requieren de, de, la, de, de la legislatura en fondos necesarios para nuestras escuelas, para nuestra salud mental. Y hoy estamos hablando de cuatro presupuestas. La primera es de eliminar a la defensa de las compañías que hacen estas armas que se llama PLACA, the Protection of Lawful Commerce in Arms Act. Puede uno demandar a las compañías de cigarro, puede uno demandar a las compañías de cerveza si se publican sus advertencias a los jóvenes, a los niños, pero por cualquier razón el Congreso ha decidido a proteger a estas compañías que hacen estas armas tal y cuando ellos publican y advierten sus armas a niños. Esa es una gran responsabilidad y responsabilidad y tenemos que remediar eso. Tenemos que eliminar la inmunidad a municipios cuando sus policías hacen los errores que hicieron, como lo que sucedió ese día en Uvalde, para que familias puedan encontrar justicia en las cortes civiles. Uh, otro presupuesto que tenemos es una compensación a heridos, compensación a familias que han perdido un niño en nuestro sistema escolar. Los ponemos en nuestros hijos cada día en los brazos de nuestras escuelas para protegerlos. Si no vamos a hacer nada de armas, debemos de darle algo a familias para que puedan seguir adelante con sus vidas sin tener que tener que hacer las decisiones tan esenciales que hacemos todos los días, como por ejemplo, ir a trabajar. Hay un niño herido, ya está sano con nosotros. Su padre es viudo. Tiene cuatro hijos y su niño chiquito no quiere que vaya a trabajo porque tiene miedo. Entonces esa persona necesita ayuda. Por eso necesitamos un sistema de compensación justo. There's a child in Uvalde who was injured, who is afraid to go back to school. Dad is homeschooling him. 
Dad is widowed with four children raising him on his own. On his own. The little boy doesn't want Dad to go back to school, to back to work. He worked in the oil field. There's no money for these folks. What's he supposed to do? What's he supposed to do? Should there be compensation for a child like that, for a father like that? Absolutely, there should be. And so that's what, those are the real conversations we need to have. Thank you so much. If you don't have anything further, well, you can talk to families individually if they're willing. But please be kind. Please be courteous. This has been a hard process. They're committed. Um, one thing that one of them said is the last thing I'll end with. She said, uh, we're going to take it to their constituents. So if my colleagues think that this is it, they're going to see vignettes, videos on Facebook in the suburbs of Houston and Dallas and Austin and everywhere in between in San Antonio where all those soccer moms live, asking them to do something and telling them you don't want to be next. Call your legislator. Call your senator. You've got to get something done. Thank you all very much. I appreciate your attendance. And again, we'll have four new bills next week that are very detailed and very, very, very bipartisan. Thank you so much. Thank you to my colleagues. I definitely appreciate you.